Hey, everybody, welcome to another edition of The Drop. Greg Wyshynski, Art O'Cal, here with you twice a week, Tuesdays and Fridays, wherever you get your audio podcasts as well. The NHL on ESPN YouTube. This week, however, will be three times as we will also, in addition to Tuesday and Friday, have a live show on Sunday after wow. our Stadium Series doubleheader wish. We got the Flyers and Devils on Saturday night, and then we will be on post-game show live on ESPN platforms after the Rangers and Islanders, and you will be there at MetLife Stadium. So excited to see Central and South Jersey turn out for Devils Flyers and then see all of North Jersey turn out for the Rangers and Islanders. Very exciting time in the Garden State, obviously. Sorry for the voice. Uh, I picked up the plague in Toronto and it's been plaguing me. How dare you? How I dare know. you? I know. Oh, with the pun at the end. Very nice. Very nice. Should have left all the uh, puns and the plagues in Canada. Speaking of Jersey turning up, very happy to be joined by our esteemed NHL reporter, <laughs> Emily Kaplan, who will be at Stadium Series, who will be uh, as part of our coverage on ABC. Uh, you, you're, the last year you did this, Emily, you were uh, like, they assigned you a team, right? You and Weeks had mm -hmm. each a team. Do you know which teams you're going to get this year? First, I just have to say that was the best intro I've ever had on any podcast on any platform. Um, <laughs> I don't know what nonsense Greg was talking about. He referenced a central jersey that might not exist. I'm oh, not again sure. with this, Kaplan, all the time with this. North Jersey will be on <laughs> the site. Governor it's said central jersey exists. Oh, my gosh. It's official. Yeah, it's canonical. Politicians. We always listen to our politicians. <laughs> Um, but the best thing about these events always is just showcasing the market that these players play in. And I hope that Jersey will be fully represented because this event is being held in New Jersey. Um, this year, yes, I do have two teams and I did put in the request because one of my main jobs on the broadcast is interviewing the coaches. So when I saw the matchups, I said, I think I want to talk to Patrick Waugh and John Tortorella. So <laughs> I'm getting Islanders and Flyers, but we shall see. Oh, that's awesome. I you know what warmed my heart those. recently was uh, uh, during, I, I think it was the ABC broadcast on Saturday when they were doing the latest edition of the uh, PKGQ that Bucci said he got a text from Tortorella that said stick to hockey. I'm <laughs> like, I believe that 150% that that actually happened. Like, Torch is just at home. He's flipping through the channels. He's like, now what's this you're doing? And just texted Bucci right off the hop. I love it. And then turned off our coverage completely. And it's just like, I'm spending the rest of the day with the horses. Cause this <laughs> is really just a horse guy. Yeah. And then just misses the meetings and is like, no, I'm not talking to you just because you're doing fashion segments. <laughs> oh, I <laughs> miss towards. Yes. Uh, I can't wait. I hope that you get that opportunity at stadium series. It's going to be a blast, but Emily, uh, let's do a empty the notebook segment here. Let's talk about everything that um, you have. Uh, you, you do a lot of reporting. You only have a limited amount of time, especially during the game broadcasts, to give us all the information that you can. So it's cool to have you on here so that you can expand on all the coverage and all the reporting that you're doing. Uh, let's start with Toronto and Ottawa. The Battle of Ontario is back, baby. All oh, the Senators and the Leafs. All oh, the slap shot into the empty net goal. All oh, the hullabaloo that ensued. All oh, the tap it to my veins. Tap the drama to my veins, Emily. So Morgan Riley is getting an in-person hearing for the cross-check. Um, what more What more can you tell us about this whole situation? It is the most divisive situation since Greg and I deb uh, debated about Central Jersey. Just, <laughs> just moments ago. Just moments ago. This is like the NHL's war bash test, right? I think we're just at this juncture where we're always talking about hockey culture, new school versus old school. So many people watch this play and see something different, and it all comes back to what is hockey code? Does hockey code even exist? And this tribalism attached to it. So I think that if you're an Ottawa Senators fan, you watch this and you say, whatever, this is old school hockey. He's so proud of our team for winning against the Leafs. And he took a little bit of a flare and it was so unnecessary that he almost tried to take his entire neck out on this cross check. If you're a Leafs fan, you watch this and say, hey, one of our players stood up for ourselves and lo and behold, player safety is picking on us again. They have a gripe against us as a franchise. Um, I was surprised to see it be an in-person hearing. I do think that this is warranted of a suspension. Personally, I think under six games makes sense, but if I could get cameras in this room to hear what the NHLPA and Morgan Riley and the Leafs are arguing on behalf of him versus the NHLPA and the Ottawa Senators are, are 
arguing on behalf of uh, Ridley Grigg. I would love to see it because I think this is going to have some real juice. Unfortunately, that'll all be behind closed doors for legal reasons. And we'll just get that player safety video explaining why Morgan Riley was suspended for X amount of games. But um, it's a great talker. This is exactly the juice that we need in the dregs of a regular season where this is the grind of it. So glad we have it. I'm dying to know if Brendan Shanahan's going to you know, be on the Leafs side of the table. It's like having a former Supreme Court justice as your <laughs> lawyer in front of the Supreme Court. The guy invented player safety uh, in the NHL. Look, a few things on this. Um, I've talked to people from the Leafs side. I I've talked to some player safety people. I think you're going to hear a bit about the David Perron hit on on, on Artem Zub uh, from earlier this season that resulted in a six game suspension. I think you're going to hear from the Leafs saying that that play is, a, is even worse than this one because of the way uh, Riley stick hits the guy versus what Perron did. Um, to me, the comp is Dale Hunter on Pierre Turgeon Arda back in the day. Like oh, the man. last time we saw this, uh, a player being basically attacked after scoring a goal, albeit one that had some, you know, in your face flourish from Greg. Uh, what was a Dale Hunter play? I mean, and, and we hold that up to being one of the more heinous things that's ever happened in the NHL. Um, I think you're going to hear about the Mark Shifley incident with Jack, Jake Evans a few years ago, where he went and pummeled the guy after the empty net editor. That was four playoff games. So we'll hear a bit about that. A couple of things. Like we talked about hockey culture and hockey code. Mm -hmm. If Morgan Riley just skates over, and does the usual BS gloved punch pantomime that we always see after like a hit someone doesn't like, or even if he drops the gloves and goes after the guy, we're not having this conversation. Agreed, 100%. He skated Agreed. over and used his stick. And when you use your stick on any play like this, and the Leafs are going to argue that like it rolled up his arm or it hit him in a certain way or he wasn't aiming high with it, he still used his stick on a play that happened well after an empty net goal was scored, okay? The other thing that's really been uh, entertaining for me was hearing the discourse from Leafs land about how this play doesn't make them soft. Dude, they look like a, just a, like a, like a cart full of toilet paper from Costco. That's how soft they look after this right now. Like you went with your stick and attacked a guy who had the nerve to score an emphatic empty net goal. That shows you to be the most emotionally fragile team in the National Hockey League. But please, memo to future Leafs opponents. Try to end your wins over Toronto very carefully. No slap shots. No Michigans. Don't go between the legs. Okay? <laughs> Find, if you have an empty net in front of you and you're about to win the game, please locate the nearest Leaf. Okay? Politely ask him how he would like to, to see you score score appropriately, and just call a night. We don't want to antagonize these guys. They clearly have a little bit of emotional problems with the way that you finish games against them uh, in a loss. So uh, let's keep that in mind. Emily, I can't wait for someone to have an empty net breakaway on the Leafs and go between the legs to score. <laughs> what are they going to do? I mean, like, what do they do? I mean, they're all afraid now. They're going to get Morgan Riley'd. But no, seriously, like, I, 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 if I had to guess... Okay. And we're doing this podcast before the hearing, you know, in person means that six or more is on the table. If I had to guess guys, I would say five. I think they might go five, avoid the neutral arbitrator, bring it down to five and, and call it a day. I think that's an educated guess, Greg. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's not because like they, there's clearly a push within the league to go more than five. Like they're not going to waste their time with an in-person hearing and not give them he, what Perron got. You, but but I think at the end of the day, like you're right, Emily. Like this is so contentious and divisive, and and people see it in such different ways that maybe the meeting of the minds brings it down to five. But I mean, usually when they have it in person, they don't go lower than six. And Emily, to your point, like if not for the stick to the face, if it was just that I shove you and it's like a a a, a fracas, you know, at the end of the game. We're not talking about this. 
May, no. Maybe the soft part. Maybe that's a conversation for talk shows, you know, sports talk shows or hot talk shows in the morning. But we're not talking about any of this to this no, degree. The way the Department of Player Safety views this, this was not a hockey play. It happened well after something consequential in the game. The game is out of hand. And he unnecessarily put an opponent at harm's risk. And when it gets that close to the face, involving the stick, as Greg mentioned, then you're like, whoa, 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 why do we exist as a department if not to roll down on something like this? Right. And what Emily said is really important, which is that a lot of the examples that are being sent by Leafs fans to me, <laughs> and I'm sure to other people, they all have to do, for the most part, with plays that are during the course of play. Or in the case of of one, where I think it was an Alex Chase on play, it was like right after the buzzer, but these two guys were drawing at each other. This this checks two huge boxes for player sure. safety. W three, actually. It's a stick. It is well after a goal is scored, right? And and it's also a guy skating over to administer the hit. They so, often count the number of strides it takes for them to get there. Precisely. So, like, there's intent. It's the timing. I know I know. we all want to talk about, like, what the stick did and, and whether or not there was an injury and things of that nature. But you can't strip away the context here. This is, like... If we talk about like the kind of play we don't want to see in the NHL, and that's why we have the Department of Player Safety, like this is it. This yeah, is you don't want a player taking, a right here. You don't want a, a player taking 15 strides that ends up with a stick to the face. I think yeah, we can exactly. all agree on that. Exactly. Um, let's 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 move on to something else we want to talk about: relocation or expansion. Emily, Utah, hot topic right now. We know that there's other cities that uh, you know. Even the commissioner during All Star Weekend mentioned a bunch of cities. He even mentioned Omaha, Nebraska. But right now we're focusing on Utah. What's the latest on um, Utah and a possible NHL team going there someday? The sense I get around the league from talking to other NHL owners, from talking to league executives, the NHL to Utah is happening. It's just a matter of how and when. Um, it could be this Arizona Coyotes team with the NHL finally losing patience in this ownership group saying, we've given you all of the patience in the world. We ask you to find a new arena. We ask you just to do it. We cannot go on any longer with us playing in a college rink. It is embarrassing. It's not fair to our players. We got to get this group out of here. We got to get rid of this ownership group. We're going to bring them to Utah because we have an owner that we trust there. We have a market that we like. We're just going to do it. Or it's going to be the owner saying, whoa, we went from 500 to $650 million in expansion fees from Vegas to Seattle. We just saw what you, uh, Ottawa sold for for $950 million. What could expansion give us? We want that money in our pocket. But the truth is this Ryan Smith, who is the owner of the Utah Jazz, he's self-made. He made that point to me that this is not his family's money. He created a tech company himself. He's still very active in the tech world. He struck up a friendship with Gary Bettman over the last several years, struck up trust with him. Gary has believed in his plan. He's like, I get that this guy doesn't want just a piece of our pie. He wants to help grow the game as well and be part of our mission. And he can bring this fresh energy, especially in the tech world, to what we're trying to grow in the NHL. We want in. Um, it's going to happen. It's inevitable. So we'll see where this all shakes out. But I hope everyone in the NHL gets used to this idea because uh, it does feel like inevitability. Emily, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, like, I've been confused as to the relocation versus expansion thing. Like, you've talked to Ryan Smith. Uh, to me, an expansion team makes more sense for him because you get a clean slate. You get the expansion draft. Like, you get all these things that you get if you if you don't get a relocated team. But you're also paying a lot more for it. Does he care either way? No. I asked him that exactly, and he goes, just bring me the NHL to Utah. I don't care how. It also seems that not to sound too like Dr. Evil, mill billionaire thing, <laughs> but like, money is no object for him. He understands how much these things cost. Um, he understands the acquisitions. He also understands that I promise where the Utah Jazz play now in downtown Salt Lake City, that's available for the NHL as soon as next season. They've staged some preseason games there. It's possible. But in talking to Gary Bettman and Bill Daly and the rest of the league, he knows that the league's preference is to get a standalone arena, um, a new arena that probably is more hockey focused that I think is going to happen anyway with the Olympics likely coming there. So um he understands that this is going to add up. I also asked him the very controversial question is, is this privately funding? Or are you going to get some taxpayer um, you know, input here? And he's like, look, I don't want to get into all of that. I just say that we've done it privately in the past. We're willing to do that. But it does seem like the Utah government is also on board of trying to help them out because they understand uh, the long-term benefits as well. Well, look, Ryan Smith, all I can tell you is don't leave it up to the people of Tempe. Okay, that's the only advice I can give you. Yeah. 
be as far away as possible. <laughs> as far away as possible. Whoever's negotiating this on the NHL side, by the way, is walking into that boardroom with dollar signs in their eyes based on exactly what you just said there, Emily. So yeah, look forward to Utah and the NHL, whether it's sooner or whether it's later. Uh, what is sooner than later, Emily, is the NHL trade deadline. You will be in Bristol as part of our coverage on trade deadline day. Uh, the trade deadline special will be uh, that day. Uh, so you, you can look forward to that. What about the busyness of the day? We've already had a couple of trades, Emily. Do you anticipate a frenzy of a day, a quiet day, something in between? I think something in between, but trending towards frenzy. You know, this is like, I feel like it's Groundhog's Day. Every time I make these calls, everyone's saying, oh, the stagnant salary cap. Everyone is so muddled in the middle in the playoff race. Like, I don't know how many teams are going to be active. But I also can't remember many years of recent past where there's teams firmly in playoff position like the Flyers who are acting like sellers just because they're a bit ahead of schedule, but they've got the long-term view in mind of building a sustainable winner. So I do think that we're going to get some action. I'm just curious which teams are going to be active because, again, the parity, P-A-R-I-T-Y, I always feel like I need to clar uh, clarify here, is up to Gary Bettman's liking. He loves the fact that it really does feel like there's so many teams jostling for a position, and if they get in the playoffs, they can beat the Florida Panthers and make it all the way. So which of those teams feel strong enough to make that move and be a bit more aggressive for a player that's off the board or might have charm and you have to give up many future assets and which of those teams are just going to stand pat or sell off themselves? I don't know about you, Em, but I'm just fascinated by the goalies. Like the, the goalie market is is really mm -hmm. interesting insofar as there being a lot of supply, there being some teams with some big demand. You know, we just saw Mark andre Fleury become the star of the night recently with his performance uh, against his former team, the Penguins. Like, if the Wilds slip out and he wants to go play for a contender, that'd be a really fascinating thing. There was obviously a report over the weekend that the Devils were engaged in talks with the Flyers for Jacob Markstrom. Like, I, 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 there are clearly teams that have a need for a goalie if they are, in fact, in the hunt for the playoffs. And there are clearly goalies available. So where that carousel ends is, to me, the most fascinating thing about the trade deadline. I'm with you because I think there's also been a market correction on goalies where all of a sudden general managers are like, whoa, 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 we don't need our goalie to be the highest paid member of our <laughs> team. And in fact, it's preferential if it's not, it's better just to get two veterans that are just okay, that are above that average line. If you can't get an Andre Vasilevsky or you can't get the guy that you know is going to play like 65% of your games and just be a stud workforce every night. Um, and it's just so much thirst for goaltending this year. You see some teams like... The Edmonton Oilers are a perfect example. The Canes, to an extent, Carolina Hurricanes, that have been looking for a goaltender all season long and are just like, no, no, price isn't right. No, guy we don't mm. trust. And they're like, we might just ride it out with what we have. But there are like those wild card guys, like you mentioned. Markstrom's a perfect one because he's got an extra year on his contract. The Flames are kind of one of those bubble teams that I mentioned. Are we sellers? Are we going to try to push for the playoffs this year? Do we approach him? Can we get this many assets for him? And then Mark andre Fleury, that's why so many teams are thirsty for him because it's like, this is the perfect guy in the perfect contract that can just push for their team for the playoffs. We just didn't make sure that he wants to leave Minnesota because that's not a guarantee also. That'll be the headline of this show. Mark andre Fleury, looking like a snack, question mark? That'll be, <laughs> as we approach trade deadline. I'm surprised. Jacob Markstrom was in, uh, with the Flames, was in Jersey. I was... Uh, Surprised he was allowed to leave Prudential Center, which I thought that he would for sure be just shackled there until the well, it, it, it's fair to say, fair to Tom, yeah, Tom yeah, yeah, exactly. Tom Fitzgerald's trank dart missed, it actually hit the mascot by accident. So, Mark's yeah, NJ, NJ, NJ is still reeling somehow. Yeah. Um, Emily, what about I know that it's always fun to ask this question around trade deadline, but if you were to like throw some names out there that you could very well see being traded by the trade deadline or even ones for us to watch out for. What names would you give us? You know, I think the two teams, and I'll mention players on these teams that I'm most okay. fascinated by are the Penguins and the Capitals, who have been like the chief rivals of the last era. Um, and we have two general managers who are grappling with we have legacy players in their organizations. Sidney Crosby and his two sidekicks for the last several years of Genny Malkin and Chris Letang. And then for the Capitals, it's Alex Ovechkin, but his two sidekicks that are still with him, TJ Oshie and John Carlson, saying, we need to do right by these players and we want to finish their career the right way. And in Washington's case, we want to see Alex Ovechkin. We've committed to letting him break the scoring record with us or having hopefully letting him do it. Um, but 
we got to stay competitive and we got to get younger. And how do we balance the needs and wants of our older veterans with also kind of retooling on the fly and not alienating our fans and having to do a full rebuild? So with both of those teams, I mean, Jake Gensel is the name that everyone's waiting on in Pittsburgh. He didn't want to sign a long-term contract with Pittsburgh to begin the season. He's like, let me see how it goes. Super, super calm from both sides. I've been actually shocked every time I talk to either his agent or people on Pittsburgh side of just how they're not stressed about going right up to the deadline, not knowing if he's going to be on the move. But if he is, teams are clamoring for him. I know the Canucks are super interested. I know the Oilers are super interested. I know that the Canes, there's so many other teams that are just kind of on the periphery like, if we could just get this guy, he's an absolute stud. And there's proof of concept, one of Greg's favorite terms, and I love what he uses, um, of seeing what he does in the playoffs. <laughs> Uh, and then on the capital side, I know a ton of teams are really interested in Joel Edmondson as a solid depth defenseman. Nick Dowd is an interesting one. You know, I've started to hear some smoke around his name, but he sent such an affordable contract and he's just a fourth line center. Like, are you really going to give up a first round pick for him? Maybe some people might. It kind of feels like Garnet Hathaway a year up prior, um, you know, of just that guy of like, whoa, I didn't know that he was worth that much kind of vibe, but he does feel like a missing piece that a team might covet. So I have my eyes locked on both of those teams and I have no idea what they're going to do. And I actually talked to Brian McClellan's, by the way, just last thing, the GM of the Caps, uh, we had their game on Saturday and I was like, what's going on here? And he told me that this current stretch that they're on, um, it was a really tough stretch. They played the Panthers and the Bruins and the Canucks and finally the Avalanche. That was going to determine what direction he went in because at some point he said the math just wasn't going to make sense. Now they were on a six game losing streak and then they beat the Bruins on the road, their best road game if not game of the season and then they lose to the Canucks in overtime so maybe that convinces him to be a little more conservative but I get the sense that he knows this probably isn't their year by the way I think I think Ovechkin breaks the Gretzky record if he can just score maybe like 40 more empty netters just <laughs> not against the Leafs for his own safety sure yeah because yeah. you know how much he loves that slap shot exactly and by the way he now leads the NHL in history and empty net goals. So he beat Gretzky in at least one category uh, as he approaches the great chase. Uh, last one for you, Emily. You had a chance to hang out with my uh, compatriot, my country guy, the Beebs at All Star. How come he wasn't part of the uh, Super Bowl halftime show? <laughs> I don't ever, you know, I I don't know. He wanted to save his one performance in two years for NHL All Star game, which was pretty cool. <laughs> Honestly, that was probably the coolest celebrity that the hockey world has brought in for a while. And he was just so infectious, his energy. Like he really just felt like this kid who won a contest and got to live out his childhood dream. Like I got to take pregame skate with my favorite players and then pump them up behind the bench. Like he was just smiling ear to ear the entire night. It was awesome super kind i was really nervous to approach him to ask him for an interview um and he was just like yeah thank you so much for asking and then we had like two minutes before we went on air and he's like how was your day uh it was funny i talked to jim montgomery who's on the bench with him and he is a really good coach because he just observes things in people he noticed that beaver just like couldn't sit still the entire time he's like tapping bopping around back there but it was great energy like it again it just felt infectious to be around him i'm glad the nhl brought him in what was um, um was, was that guess, Jim Montgomery's son that was with him? Like, is he a Bieber fan? Because he know, loved, every, looked like he loved you. Yeah, everyone was talking about Bieber's jacket, but like Jim Montgomery's kid had a swaggy sweater vest. Yeah. Like, he, he dressed. <laughs> yes. I wanted to ask you: Did you pet the coat? And if you didn't pet the coat, how hard was it not to pet the coat? I don't think I intentionally pet the coat, but I, I definitely uh, like felt it. You know, being next to him because it was so big, it was hard to uh, <laughs> not and. It was quite soft. I'm sure it was worth every of the many thousands of pennies that it was worth. <laughs> the, uh, I thought that the celebrity choices at All-Star were terrific. Like Will Arnett was super into it. I love that in your interview with him, he was like, I just met Wendell Clark. This is like the greatest day of my life, right? Like, I don't know. I felt like the casting or the celebrities brought in were absolutely terrific. Like, do you think that they're going to uh, be regulars in the NHL circuit? What, what, what vibe did you get? Yeah, well, next year is going to be the best All-Star game because we get best on well, some best on best competition in uh, the Four Nations tournament. Yeah. But I agree with you. I think that they were all super relevant and just super happy to be there. Like Will Arnett, it was so apparent to me that he was a hockey fan. You picked up on it, like how geeked out he was to meet Wendell Clark, how geeked out he was just to, like fist bump Connor McDavid and say that they were buds. It's always strikes me like it's still really weird to me when people know who I am. But like the first day in the locker room, he just comes up to me and we didn't say anything. He just goes, hello, Emily. 
And I'm just like, oh, like he clearly just watches our games all the time. Like that's pretty cool. So I do think that he would like to be a little bit more involved in the hockey world than he has to an extent, but he was just awesome and super engaged the whole time. Tate McRae, like we don't, yeah, we don't need Dude, to say Lego, Lego Batman knows your name. That's so very cool. Yeah, that's no, awesome. It was, it was my well, Michael Bluth for me. Um, but <laughs> Uh, yeah, no. And then um, Buble obviously stole the show with his candor. And uh, just I had no idea he was that kind of personality. Um, so I think he shocked a lot of the moms and grandmas out there who just love his Christmas albums. That's true. It was a, it was a mushroom filled weekend, whether Justin Bieber was wearing it or Michael Buble was allegedly Here taking it. Um, Emily, you're the best. You rock. Thanks for joining us here on The Drop. Uh, enjoy Stadium Series. Can't wait to uh, hear that interview. Both of those interviews with Patrick Waugh and Torts, uh, they are slated to be all-timers. I appreciate it. And I can't wait to show off North Jersey and everything it has to offer. The entire Garden State, I am sure, will be represented given the four teams involved. Uh, but the event is happening in North Jersey, which is my favorite part of New Jersey. That's right. North Jersey, then hit the skip button, and then you're in South Jersey. That's yeah, exactly. and no, then you're in Philadelphia. But <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Emily. Cheers, guys. Thanks again to Emily Kaplan for joining us here on the drop. So, wish you have a fun project uh, that is an NHL rankings project. Your top ten. Uh, is this going to be by position when it's all said and done? Tell us about this. Project. It, it is. So let me explain this. So it's the NHL positional positional rankings, and we've done it now for the last couple of years. And so you get your like player surveys right of like who are the top 10 goalies according to the players and then you get like your executive surveys where like somebody emails all the gms like who's your top 10 centers well i take the peanut butter and the jelly and i make it into a delicious sandwich 10 players 10 executives all put together for an essential list of the top 10 players at center at wing on defense and goaltenders and the results are usually really fascinating. We get into the numbers. We figure out who says what. We get some anonymous comments from these guys to really kind of spice things up. And it ends up being a really fun list. So we kick it off with the defenseman, Arda, uh, okay. the positional rankings that just published on ESPN.com. You can read the story there as well. And so we give us with... just like an idea. Like, so it's 10 players and 10 executives. How are they choosing these players? Is it just an overall? Are there categories? Yeah, give me your 10 best in the league right now. And then what we do is they list them, uh, you know, one through 10. It's a it's a survey they take. Okay. Uh, we assign, assign point totals for each, you know, ranking. Tally it up, get our top 10. Um, you know, there's always snubs. There's always people left outside. There's always surprises. Uh, and uh, it's it's pretty good you know, for the most part. Um, the list itself this year will begin with probably one of the bigger surprises for defensemen. At number 10, Drew Doughty, Arden, Woo! makes the top 10. Now, he just edged out Rasmus Dahlin from the Buffalo Sabres, and uh, I had one uh, voter tell me that they could not believe that that happened, that they would have taken Rasmus Dahlin 10 times out of 10 over Drew Doughty. I had an NHL executive tell me, and I quote, Drew Doughty has been living off his reputation for five seasons. Wow. And yet, and yet, if you take the sum total of all the votes from the players and the executives, Drew Doughty is the 10th best defenseman currently in the National Hockey. Today, the best defenseman in the NHL today, which yeah. is makes a lot of sense, that anonymous comment of people saying, I would rather pick Rasmus Dahlin today. Fair yeah. enough. Fair yeah. enough. Uh, number nine, that. also a bit of a surprise, Josh Morrissey of the Winnipeg Jets. Okay. Uh, I had some people, you know, who did the survey tell me they were surprised to see him make the top 10, but a lot of support, both from the executives and from the players, for Morrissey to make this cut. Um, and again, you think about all the defensemen that have been left out of the mix here, uh, as you'll see on this list, guys like Eric Carlson, you know, Darlene, other players with with a lot of juice, uh, and and Josh Morrissey makes the list at number nine. Um, number eight is going to make people happy, I think. It's Jacob Slavin of the nice. Carolina Hurricanes, long considered to be the best defensive defenseman in the NHL and getting his uh, getting love for both peers and executives. I think the executives might have been a little bit more in love with Slavin than were the players, but man, is he good. I like that pick. And, 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 and especially the fact that 
we don't often reward defensive defensemen. Just look no further than the Norris Trophy voting, right? Like, yeah, it's 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 nice to see this. So that so he's at number eight. Correct. And number seven and number six are very interesting. So Roman Yossi of the Nashville Predators is at seven. Mm. Victor Hedman of the Tampa Bay Lightning is at six. Both of these guys were in the top five in last year's positional ranking. And one of the respondents said, I don't think there's a top seven. I think there's a top five, meaning this person felt that Hedman and Yossi are just a cut below the next five guys. I think that's up for debate. I think both these guys, despite being veterans, are still incredible defensemen uh, on both ends of the ice. But they rank out at seven and six to make room for some new blood, Arda. Yeah, and honestly, the names that are floating in my head that would occupy the top five, that's very tough to argue because that's like an elite squad in the top five. So, but please go ahead and reveal who's at number five. Yeah, let's get to it. So number five is Charlie McAvoy. And, and, and let's be honest here, by the way, Charlie McAvoy, Boston Bruins defenseman and NFL prognosticator King nailing the Super Bowl pick, picking the chiefs, finishing eight and five on the season as the drops official football handicapper. Um, I think at this point, Arda, like, he should just assume he's going to be fifth on all these lists. Like there always seems sure, to be like sure. four guys that are ahead sure. of him at all times. Yeah. He's great. Terrific two way defenseman. I think the more I think about Charlie McAvoy, if this guy could maybe pick up a few more power play points at some point in his career, like I feel like he could maybe get over the hump, but as it stands, it just seems like there are always like four guys ahead of him on these lists. Yes. I do agree, though, that the potential is there for him to go higher on the list with a little bit more stat padding or, uh, you know, a little bit more time, uh, a little bit more seasons ahead. The potential is definitely there. Number four is Adam Fox of the New York Rangers. Oh, now you make I this little, heat you now. made a little squealy noise. Why'd you make a squealy noise? I feel the heat. Hold on, let me just warm my hands on the heat that you're about to bring here, putting Adam Fox at number four and all the Rangers fans that are gonna come hard at us because of this, because of this choice. Hey, now, first of all, it ain't me. This, this ain't right, some, right. No, this yeah, let's be clear. This, this ain't some devil's fan putting his finger on the no, scale, all right? This is so Adam 10 Fox, players and 10 executives that exactly. selected this. Adam Fox was second overall in last year's ranking. Uh, he drops to fourth this year, and I think there's probably one reason why, um, and you'll, we'll get to it. But the thing about Fox that that still is kind of a detriment to his game is his play on the penalty kill. It was the the thing that was called out last year. The stats back up the fact he's not a great penalty killer, and in fact, his ice time has decreased by almost over almost a minute per game on the kill this year under Peter Laviolette. So maybe that's a flaw in his game that some people see. I don't know what it is, but, but he was actually left off of two ballots uh, this year. One from wow. a Western conference veteran player, one from an Eastern conference executive. So maybe that's the difference, but Adam Fox is fourth. Uh, third, Miro Heiskanen of the Dallas stars. He was seventh last year. I think his point production last season, a strong playoff from him as well, really boosted his his cachet in the eyes of a lot of voters. Um, you know, I, I think they a lot of people see him as as a top three defenseman now, even though he's never been top three for the Norris Trophy. Are you surprised by him being third? Your point about the penalty kill, I guess it justifies and understandably why he would be one below Hayskinen. I'm still a little surprised because Adam Fox at the end of the day is still a Norris Trophy caliber the winner. Uh, you know, elite yeah. defenseman. Yeah, exactly. And a, and a finalist and last year, yeah. Exactly. So I guess in that frame of mind, how do you, l l let me ask you, I mean, again, I want to stress, this isn't you making these picks. These are 10 players and 10 executives. What was your reaction when you saw Adam Fox net out at four and Hayskin at three? I was surprised by that. I wasn't surprised that, that Fox wasn't number two anymore, as we'll get to. But like, oh, for sure. For him sure. going to four, I, I was a little surprised. I always assumed that, that like we have a big three, right? And that Fox is part of that big three. Again, when a guy is second for the Norris, 
and then is fourth overall in this ranking, the math doesn't seem to square. But again, like that's where the, that's where the that's what's fascinating about the process is you yes. never know for sure how the execs and the players when you mash them together what it's going to add up to. What it added up to for number two is Quinn Hughes going from I kid you not failing to garner a single vote in the top 10 in last year's ranking to being second overall in this year's ranking. What a difference a season makes. And there's no arguing against it. Like he's demonstrably been either the first or second, but the best defenseman in the league this year, the numbers are there. The work rate is there. The impact is there. I mean, his, his ascent certainly did bump Fox down. Um, but there's no arguing how good Quinn Hughes has been this year. No surprise who number one is going to be, but I would like to ask you how many first place votes did Quinn Hughes receive? All right. So when you, when you break it down, our first place winner, Kel McCarr had first place votes on 17 of the 20 ballots. Adam Fox was a first place uh, pick for one NHL veteran. And Quinn Hughes was the defenseman who received the other two first place votes uh, from our group, uh, one from an executive and one from a player. So that makes a lot of sense. Kale McCarr, no one is disputing the fact that he's the consensus number one defenseman in the league today. And I'm sure that he could very well occupy that for years to come. I mean, he's the, Conor Mc, the, he's the Connor McDavid of the blue line. Like he does absolutely. things that other people can't do. He seems to get better year over year. Um, you know, the numbers and, are all there. And and again, like when we start thinking about history here, Arda, when we start thinking about what we're actually witnessing here, if you look at defensemen that have played at least 250 games in this league, he's behind two guys in points per game average. That would be Bobby Orr and Paul Coffey. So not yeah, it's bad. not a surprise when McCarr wins no. these 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 surveys because no. we're watching one of the best ones of all time. But uh he might not win the Norris this year, man. That might be Quinn Hughes's to win. No, Quinn Hughes has made such an improvement that it's almost undeniable for him. Uh I will say this: you mentioned Connor McDavid and Kale McCarr being the McDavid of the blue line. How many times has Kale McCarr faced Connor McDavid and made him look pedestrian in certain <laughs> plays? Like that's another testament to how great Kale McCarr is. So this was your this was the top ten uh, in terms of defensemen. What is the rollout for the other positions? Well, that we'll get the goalies uh, later this week, uh, and then the centers and wingers uh, the following week. Just wanted to mention though some of the the surprising results underneath the top ten. As sure. I mentioned, Rasmus Who's Dallin eleven. Was, well, that was Dalene. He was okay. two points okay. behind Drew Doughty. It was a very very close vote. <clears throat> Uh, but just came up short. Uh, but you think about all the defensemen that didn't make the cut. I mean, both of Vegas's defensemen, Alex Petrangelo and Shea Theodore, neither make the top 10. Morgan mm -hmm. Riley doesn't make the top 10. Um, Eric Carlson, Chris Letang don't make the top 10. Uh, Dougie Hamilton, who was number 10 last year, falls out of the top 10. Noah Dobson, who might be a top three for the Norris, he had a pretty strong showing, but did not make the top 10. So, Again, it's it's a very crowded field, uh, but still, I think I think there's going to be some debate over number nine and number ten versus the guys who didn't make the list this year. Let us know in the comments. We'll be active throughout the week as well, and hope to get the com continue the conversation, especially on this top ten list. What do you think of the ten players and ten executives that formulated this top ten list, and where different players are slotted? on this top 10 list. We look forward to the goaltenders and the centers and wingers, like you said. Thank you for listening to The Drop. Remember, this is a three-episode week. Our <laughs> normal cadence, Tuesday and Friday, wherever you get your audio podcasts and the NHL and ESPN YouTube. A special episode on Sunday after the stadium series matchup between the Rangers and Islanders. That will be live on ESPN Facebook, the ESPN app, as well, the NHL and ESPN YouTube. And if you only listen to us in audio, that will be uploaded as well. So it will be a special three-episode week here for us on The Drop. We will see you all on Friday. Take care. Watch out for Leafs.